All right, our topic, as you uh, know, is um, can you be homosexual and Christian? The answer is yes. Any questions? Um, okay, well, I better give you more for your money. Um, and I, I, I listened this morning to Lenny Kravitz's song, I Want to Go Away, I Want to Fly Away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I just, I do, there was a part of me partly a little exhausted from some of the excitement of the last few weeks. And partly this topic is not an easy topic to be talking about. It's one where um, it, it touches very deeply um, to where we live. Um, if it's not us personally struggling with various questions of sexual attraction, it's people who we love deeply and dearly. And um, it's, a, it's a difficult issue to speak on, I think, with any honesty in the light of what Jesus says. Uh, so I would have liked to get away. But another part of me was um, quite eager to um, at least look at what some of the Bible does and doesn't say and introduce you to a friend. I to spoke to two of my old mates uh, who I've known for decades this morning and told them what I was doing and they, at least one of them just seemed to, could not make any sense of what I was talking about because we live in a strangely uh, orthodox culture in so many ways. Now last week we looked at is Christianity homophobic and worked out that um, for many people there's an obvious answer. The problem is that there are many other people who think there's an obvious answer which is the opposite of that answer. And this does sometimes take us back to questions of definition. It's, it's hard sometimes to, to play definitional things when you're dealing with really deep and um, uh, emotionally strong areas. But it is important that we think carefully. I, I don't have any doubt that most of us have experienced decades of a complete and thorough education on what we should think. There are things that I believe about homosexuality and how homosexuals can and, and, and should live. That even though I know it to be true, I, there's a part of me that says, don't say that. Uh, in fact, you really shouldn't even think it. And I'm saying, shut up. I'm allowed to think and base my knowledge in my beliefs on what... I'm talking to myself, not to you. And that, but I'm, just, I'm, I'm surprised at the way in which things that I know to be true about various friends uh, and uh, s serious university studies I've read from around the world, I, s I still can barely bring myself to say them. Uh, because uh, it's just... We've, ha we've had a long and very consistent education program in our culture. Uh, but we do need to think hard. Uh, it's been said, and I think it's true generally, that you're not what you think you are, but you are what you think. Uh, you're not what you think you are. We often have lots of illusions about who we are, but we are what we think. And what we think about ourselves and God and other people is the most important things in how we therefore live. So, in terms of the fact there's been a lot of misinformation, there's been a lot of education going, let's, let's think clearly, at, at least I'll try and think clearly, about these two key words in this, this question, which is homosexual and Christian. Those words can be used to cover quite different areas. So, here's how I want to suggest you two definitions uh, instead of the word homosexual. And that is to use a phrase that some of my gay friends like and some don't, and that is the phrase same-sex attraction. Uh, the trouble with homosexual, it, 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 it attempts to, it's a, it identifies a person by a particular part of their humanity and says, bang, that's who you are. It's a little bit like I had a sister who was in a wheelchair and they, they tried to stop people calling her a quadriplegic. Ah, that's what you are. You're quad no, no, no. She's a human with a certain disability. Or those of you who are diabetic, some, some diabetics don't like being called diabetics. Not diabetics, that's, oh, that's, oh, I know what you are. No, they're humans with diabetes and where there's been a, a wise uh, pulling back from this using a, a part of our who we are as humans and making that our identity. So I think it's, it's perhaps more helpful and uh, will hopefully bring some light if we speak about people who find themselves with same-sex attractions. They didn't choose it, there's been a lot of debate, a lot of false um, alleged science that was uh, particularly big in the 90s uh, about the origins of same-sex attraction and I think they're multi they're, they're multifactorial and these things are fluid and difficult to nail down in human behavior but some people in in the same way as 95 96 97 percent of humans when they become sexually awake find themselves just instinctively attracted to people of the opposite sex there is a part of our of our, the human family who find themselves attracted to people of the same sex and that's what we're talking about same-sex attraction if you are heterosexual, you know there's no, no thing, you should pat yourself on the back and say, well, I'm so much better than people with same sex. Rubbish. You didn't choose to be heterosexual. The great overwhelming percentage of people who are gay didn't choose to have same sex attraction. They, they have to work out how to live with that part of their humanity. So that's people 
That's one way you could describe homosexual, same-sex attraction. The other way is, uh, I've coined a few letters here myself that I know won't catch on, and that's S-S-A-A-L, instead of S-S-A, same-sex attraction. So S-S-A-A-L, I think, stands for same-sex same attraction and lifestyle. Okay, I'm, I don't expect that to catch on, that's okay. But the difference between that and the first one is to say this, that there are some people who find that their instinctive, default, natural attraction is to people of the same sex. That is not the same thing as people who then go on to say, and I will live that out. I will make that a part of my lifestyle. I will have active sexual relations with people of the same sex, and that's part of who I choose to become. They are two different things. We'll uh, look at how that affects our thinking in a minute. Now, when it comes to defining what a Christian is, um, when we had a panel here a little while ago, uh, Peter was here and he had a definition of being Christian that would have been interesting to tease out. It was not a definition that I shared, but it, it was held with good faith. And I don't think he was being mischievous. We just have a different definition. What do I mean by um, the word Christian? And I'm suggesting that the view I'm going to take here is just a classic one that Christians have been using for a couple of thousand years. And you can find it in John 8, the first of the four Bible passages, just briefly. We looked at this briefly last week, even more briefly this week. And it's where this very famous encounter between a woman caught in the act of sin and Jesus. Just to cut right to the end, it's where the famous phrase, uh, you know, casting the first, you know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. No one throws any rocks. Verse 10. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This woman, I take it, has the sort of central encounter of what it is to be Christian. That is, she has a personal meeting with Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today and forever. And there are people in this room who have met Jesus who are not psychologically disturbed, I don't think, um, but who have had a personal encounter with the same Jesus. And there are two parts to it in those last words that Jesus says to her. He does not condemn her. She was caught in the act of adultery. She doesn't argue she was framed. So he says that I'm not going to condemn you. He says in John 3, he didn't come to condemn but to save. That's his preferred mode of action. So at one level, that's, that's half of being Christian, to be welcomed, to be accepted, to be received by the God of judgment and grace. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. And for some people, he then blots his copybook. He says, go now and leave your life of sin. So he is in no doubt that what she's done is sinful. It is evil. It is wicked. I mean that in the, in the truest, strongest senses of those words. She was engaging in sexual activity that she ought not to have been doing. She may have had a hundred reasons for it. But before God, they're all just excuses for sin. So this is the double, the double thing of, of, of Christianity. It's to be both forgiven and to be called to repent. Some of you have heard me say before, it's one of my favourite ideas, I didn't think of it, that Christianity flies on two wings most of the time, and most truth does. Christianity is not just forgiveness, nor is it just repentance. It's not just, I don't condemn you, nor is it, go and sin no more, it's both. It's to meet Jesus, which means Saviour. It's to meet Christ, which means King. That's the experience. That's what it is to be Christian. It's to meet the loving Saviour who is also the King. To be embraced with all of your weirdness and your brokenness. And I don't want to quote Mr Rumsfeld who butchers that management thing about there are known knowns and unknown knowns and all this sort of thing. But there was a truth that he had butchered. Um, and that is that when you become a Christian, there are areas of your life where you know you and God are going to work on it. Uh, in fact, some areas you're really hoping he can change you. That's why people, some people become Christians. There's things I think, I really am not functioning well. There are some areas like when I became a Christian that I quite liked about myself, that I knew Jesus wasn't very happy with, and I very unhappily said, okay. But there were other areas that he wanted to change that I had not the faintest clue on. But I hang around with him for a little while. I think, well, of course he wants to change that. So when we come to Jesus um, and we say to him, here I am. There's no one like you. There's no one worthy of my trust like you. I put my confidence in you. He does not condemn us, but he does call us to sin no more. Now, before we look at some specifics and then I get a guest up here briefly, um, 
it's very helpful, I think, to get what sin is clear. I'm, when I chat with my friends, it's perfectly clear most of my friends haven't got the vaguest, faintest idea what sin is. People tend to think sin is being less than perfect. Uh, people think sin is when you're a bit naughty, uh, when you break the law of God, some petty law God has made do. That's not it at all. Like lots of things, if you want to understand something, go back to the very beginning. See it the first time it comes up. If you want to understand sin, go back to a really simple story, which is as deep as they get. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve in the garden, dirty, huge, big orchard, eat whatever you like, just one tree you shouldn't eat from. You eat from that tree, you will die. Um, they're happily in this huge, big orchard. They could ignore that tree. They, attention gets drawn to it, uh, and they decide to eat. What is the significance of the tree? What is the significance of eating from the fruit? See, there's nothing inherently wicked about eating fruit from trees, is there? It's the fact that God says, all those yours, this one I'm saying no to. It's the fact that at that point they say to God, shut up. I will do whatever I want to do. I mean, who the hell do you think you are, God? Telling me what I should and shouldn't do and what would you know? And the, the essential heart of wickedness, if you want to know the heart of darkness that's in you, that's in our country, that's in me. It's that propensity we have to say to God, I will make the laws around here. I will be the law maker. See, it's not that we become law breakers. It's much, much more serious than that. It's we become the law maker. That's the essence of human wickedness. You can be a thoroughly nice person, but be deeply wicked. Because it's how you treat God in God's universe. You come and pretend that you're travelling in some terra nullis universe. We know the wickedness of whitefellas and we did that to our Aboriginal neighbours. Nobody owns this land, rack off, it's ours. Well, even worse, friends, fine, noble, you know, Australian of the year type people do that to God. Terra nullis. We make up right and wrong as we go. And when God agrees with us, he gets a big tick. Good on you, God. When he's wrong and disagrees with us, that's the essence of sin. So when I become a Christian, I say to God, okay, I've got some brokenness I know about, some I don't. Where do I go with the question of sex? If I've got same-sex attractions, what do I do with that? Well, I say to God, geez, what do you think? Now, some of you may have seen Q&A, or have had this raise of people. People say things like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be more neutral. Um, Jesus never says anything about homosexuality, does it? So it can't, it can't be an important. Really? Seriously, that's how you want to argue? If Jesus doesn't say it, it's not important? So child sacrifice is okay. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a, it sounds profound, and it's a great... It's normally used by people who know, because of their social upbringing, they know that men having sex with men is fine. It's just like having... Some people got brown eyes, some people got blue eyes, etc. It, that, it's morally neutral. And in order to shut Christians down, they ask the question. That's how it was used on Q&A some time ago. It's a totally useless way of arguing because on that basis you know you can do all sorts of things because Jesus doesn't talk about it anyone who's bothered to read the teaching of Jesus knows how it works Jesus gets asked questions about divorce but not about homosexuality why because no one in ancient Israel had the slightest doubt what God thought about homosexuality therefore it doesn't come up they don't say Jesus do you think there might be lots and lots of gods do you think it might be okay to reinstitute sacrifice of babies like like our ancestors did and it's not an issue. Homosexuality is not an issue. Divorce is an issue. Greed is an issue. Cruelty to the poor is an issue. So that's the stuff Jesus gets asked. Now, when Christianity moves out of the Jewish context um, into the Greek context, something has to be said about homosexuality because we know that in the Greek world and the Roman world, um, homosexual love was absolutely a common thing. Long, well, not long running, but, but deeply caring homosexual relationships were common enough in that culture. They never did what we're doing, which is quite interesting. They had a really open view on homosexuality for, de for hundreds of years. Never crossed their mind to try and change the structure of marriage. That's a, that's a remarkably us thing and interesting. But um, when Christianity hits the Greek world, then it speaks about that because then it has to. Now, if you have a look at the, the readings there, there um, just really quickly, uh, this may irritate you more than help you. Genesis 2, as I mentioned last week, and we will come back to this next week when we look at Christian, repression, uh, Christian joy and sexual repression, etc. This is really the, the Bible's basic 
teaching on sex. This is the essential picture. This is how God designed it to be. This is the fireplace in the house. You want to know where the fire goes? This is where it goes. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother. He shall be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife are both naked. They felt no shame. This is the place where sex is to be enjoyed and to flourish. A lifelong family, man and a woman, monogamous, till death us do part, they become one. Now that relationship has always been in trouble. Frankly, there's not a single thing we humans do that doesn't get in trouble. Uh, you don't invalidate the good by simply saying it doesn't always work. Oh, really? You mean sometimes the UN doesn't work? Well, let's get rid of it. You mean sometimes nurses screw up and people die and they don't? Well, let's get rid of nurses. I mean, it's just, yeah, that's not how you work unless you've got an agenda. But that's where it works. Now, what the Bible, when it talks about other forms of sex and identifies as not that, not that, not that, not that, it's simply saying, no, 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 have the fire in the fireplace, not in the bathroom, not in the vase, not in the middle of the lounge room. It does go through sometimes with the knots, but it's really just under, under, sort of undergirding what it says here about where it belongs. Um, we'll just draw attention to the last one, 1 Corinthians 6. If you read 1 Corinthians, it's hardly, it's anything but a sleep-inducing book. Corinth was a notoriously sexual, sort of sexy city. In 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul is dealing with the, the Christians who don't seem to be all that surprised that a man has decided to take up sexual relations with his stepmom. And the Apostle Paul said, no, nah, don't think so, boys. Uh, later on, he's going to talk about the Christians who were going home from church via the brothel and saying, no, nah, that's not actually the way we do it. Um, the Greeks in Corinth, they needed all sorts of help. And here's a very clear statement. There's just sort of stating in a sense what is fairly obvious. Do you not know, 1 Corinthians 6, that wrongdoers or the unjust will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And the Bible only about two or three times uses this phrase, do not be deceived. And it always says it about something where you are very likely to be deceived. Something that you're going to hear, you're going to go, nah, seriously? Don't be deceived, God says. And neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Right, the Corinthian church was made up with people who had been adulterers, who had been slanderers, had been swindlers, had been homosexual men, etc. And that is what they were. But they have been washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it was a real issue for Christians then, and it is now. I thought rather than me continue to talk, I might invite Hayden up. Hayden, you want to come out the front? Um, to talk about this question of um, can you be gay and um, Christian? You want to get near the mic? I want to ask you just if I can thank you for coming. Uh, what sort of experience have you got in this question of being homosexual and Christian? Um, well, I um, uh, ha have had to deal with this myself personally. So when I was about 13, um, I, I, I realized that I, I had same-sex attraction. Uh, it's not something, as you said before, that I chose. I didn't think, you know, of all the things in life uh, that I could be, um, you know, a lawyer, an astronaut, a pastor, I'll be gay, um, you know. <laughs> no, it didn't work out like that. It's, um, it's, it just kind of came as a realization. And the problem was that when, when, that, when I was going through all this, I told, I told my parents and they didn't know how to handle it. Um, I grew up on the North Shore, which, probably explains a lot. Um, <laughs> they didn't know how to deal with it. Um, I went to certain pastors, they didn't know how to deal with it. And so one of my reservations in, in actually talking about this whole thing with anybody was the idea that if I came out and told people what I was struggling with, they would automatically put on me a word of gay or homosexual. Uh, and it's a word that's been only been used in the last two or three hundred years. It's, not, it's, a, it's a very recent word that came up in the Romantic Age in, in Europe. It's, uh, it, before then, no one ever used it. it. Homosexuality was never seen as a lifestyle choice. 
as it is today. Um, so I didn't want to be called that, but unfortunately, our Western culture puts people in binary categories of gay or straight. And I didn't want to be put in those boxes because I knew that although this was a certain part of me, this is not the, the total sum of who I was. I also happen to like chocolate. I happen to like playing golf. I happen to like all sorts of other things, but those aren't who I am. They're a part of who I am. And so I've had to wrestle with, with all these sorts of things like, who am I? Um, and I know that a lot of heterosexual people don't necessarily have to think through these things because it's just a given that that's part of who you are. But I've had to think about this in excruciatingly frustrating detail about who am I? Am I am, is this who I am? Is, are people who I say I am? Who gets to dictate who I am? I don't know who I am. Other people don't know who I am, but maybe God does. And so I've had to wrestle with that about, well, do I actually call myself gay and Christian? Um, and yeah, so that's, it's been a personal thing. So did you spend, and you can say none of your business, anymore, but, but did you spend some time living as a homosexual man? Yeah, I did for about four or five years. Um, I, I lived, as a, I lived uh, a gay lifestyle, I was very promiscuous. And one of the problems is, um, was, you know, I, I just thought that this is, well, this is who I am. This is who I am. Uh, this is how I must be because everyone else says that this is who I am. Um, so, yeah, I, I did that for quite a while. And that was put in the past tense. Um, why? Can you tell us briefly, and so, so we don't have much time, why and how you are... I mean, you're, I think I saw on Facebook that you've been married for a few years. Yeah. Now, that's, that's hard for some people to believe. You're just living an appallingly repressed life where you're pretending to be, you know, interested in your wife. How's that work? Um, no, I don't pretend to be interested in my wife at all. I'm, she's really interesting. Um, <laughs> she's Korean, so it's even more interesting. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, you know, um, it's, it's an interesting point because one of the things that, that was certainly discussed in the 90s among a lot of um, kind of ex-gay ministries like Exodus International was this idea of reorientation. It was very, very popular to talk about this in the 90s that, well, it says in the Bible, be holy because I'm holy, but then, well, some people kind of read into the Bible and said, well, it then means be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. Um, thank God the Bible doesn't say that. Um, mm. But it was, uh, I actually came to realise, well, I, I kind of toyed around with this and thought, well, if I, if I do get married and if I try to be attracted to the, same, to, to the opposite sex, is that going to heal me or cure me? And uh, I actually found that actually that wasn't the case, that um, I, you know, I'd even met people who had been married, had not dealt with their sexual issues, and then later all the, all the mess came out when they started um, living a double life behind their spouse's back. Um, so I, it then occurred to me that actually, um, although God does not want me to be living a same-sex attracted lifestyle, he actually, um, you know, he's, he's made me not to live like that, but um, he wants me to be holy. So. Whether or not I've got same-sex attraction, opposite-sex attraction, whether or not I'm dealing with greed or whatever other problem I've got, pride, he wants me to walk in holiness. I know that he didn't make me, he did, I know that, he didn't make me that way, um, but... Hang on, hang on, the, the, everyone says he does. I mean, Lady Gaga says that, that we were made that way if we're gay. So you don't think you were created that way, genetically? No, I don't. Um, um, actually, just, just um, I mean, to, just to give you a bit of context about myself, I'm pastoral worker of a ministry called Liberty Christian Ministries, which helps people with unwanted homosexuality. And just last night at our committee meeting, we were discussing this whole issue. Um, the medical evidence, the scientific evidence um, is, 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 is null, is that there is no evidence at all that, uh, that people are born gay. Um, and there's been 30 years of this by gay scientists, by, by, by straight scientists um, of Christian and non-Christian backgrounds, and there has been nothing to even c come within cooey of proving that people are born gay. Uh, so I don't believe that people are born gay. I also believe in the Bible that God does not make people gay. Uh, that's my understanding of passages like Leviticus, where it says that the act of sodomy is actually is the abomination. It's funny that Leviticus never describes the person as the abomination. He describes their action, their sin, as the abomination. Uh, so that says to me that actually God did not make people this way. He did not make people to sin. Um, but as you said, people become lawmakers. So um, no, I don't believe I was born this way. And this actually came to, came to light when I read Titus 2, 11 to 14. 
And in that passage, it says, actually, we can say no to ungodliness. We can say no to fleshly desires because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. And I thought, I can say no to sin. Wow, that's pretty amazing because if I'm just born that way and I'm just a victim of my DNA and my circumstances, well, I'll have to, you know, hoist the white flag and throw my arms up and throw myself into any kind of abominable thing, whether it's gay or straight. Um, But actually, it says that we actually say no to sin. And in that passage from 1 Corinthians, it says four, four times it says what some of you were. This is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. It's past tense. These people overcame this. There's nothing in there that says that they were just born this way, that they were victims. They overcame it. Uh, so um, that's, um, you know, that, that was a big thing for me. Uh, now, when I found last night on the... We've known each other only for a, you know, a few weeks. I've had other friends who've gone through a similar journey to you, but I've... I thought, oh, I'm going to get this guy up and don't know him all that well. And I, I did find a bit of your life story on, um, through the, the website for Liberty Ministries. Um, what do you think, just, in, just in, cl- in closing, is the most helpful thing that a person who finds themselves with trusting Jesus but find themselves attracted to people of the same sex can do? Just, and, or, and even more briefly, those who aren't same sex attracted... What can they do to help people who are, do you think? And you've got about 10 seconds before the next uh, advertisement. Um, Well, if you are someone who is same-sex attracted, um, the truth is that God has made you uh, for something else. Um, He has not made you to live like that. And even though there are many voices in today's culture that's pushing you, that might push you in that direction or encourage you to go in that direction, you have choices. We all have choices. We all live with our choices. And God has not only called us to be saved, he's actually called us to holiness. And it says in Hebrews 12 that without holiness, no one will ever see God. Um, so um, it, it, it might be excruciatingly hard, especially in the first, in the first stages, to be, to be pure and to keep your eyes and, your, and, 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 and the rest of your body pure. But that's what God has called you to do. And he's given the church and the Holy Spirit to make that possible. Uh, if you're not someone uh, who has this problem and you've got friends or relatives or anything, it's always important to, to always go back to scripture on the issue of sex. Sex, in the, you know, uh, so, so you, go, you go to Genesis and, and you see where, where it belongs. You go to Matthew 19, where actually Jesus upheld the male-female model. He actually did... Speak he actually did rule out homosexuality by saying it's only between a man and a woman. He did that in Matthew 19. You always go back to scripture. Don't go to Lady Gaga. Go to, the, go to scripture. And don't just go to Genesis. Read Song of Solomon. And it's an amazing story about, where, about how great sex is when it's in its rightful place. If you read chapter 5, their friend, like they had this relationship together where they're like friends and they're like siblings. And unfortunately, we've, we live in a culture that's removed friendship from sex. And so th- this is what's happening. Uh, so always maintain that and, all, and always go back to God's word in love and humility and grace. But always go back to God's word and never compromise that, even though it might really feel awkward. Yeah, that's what I'd suggest. Good. Thanks, Abe. Thank you very much. Um, just before we throw it open for questions, friends, um, I was chatting with a, a friend who's been through a similar journey um, as Hayden has, and he... He said um, he thought the most important thing for him as a young man when he discovered that he had these sort of attractions that was that to, to, be, to find people he could trust to begin to be open with it about rather than do, try to deal with it on his own. And he said just about everything that his society has taught him is wrong. He said society says you can't change and you can. Society actually says you shouldn't try and you should. In fact, it says you should embrace it. Uh, and he says that really isn't the way forward. Now, there's much more that could be said basically... I'm going to shut up rather than just try and pull it together. So we've got some time for questions. Uh, If God didn't make people gay and it's not a choice, then why do people have same-sex attraction? Is it because of sin? Um, I'm going to toss this with the other ones uh, to Hayden. But um, in the readings that I've been doing for some months in trying to prepare for this, um, I would think what's... What's crystal clear is what we were being taught in the 90s, I think quite deliberately, deceptively, but it was on the front page of the Herald. I remember reading it, so it must be true, that it's all genetic. It's exactly the same reason why I've got brown eyes. And even if that's true, which it isn't, um, that doesn't tell you anything about how you should behave. There are, when I served at Shaw School for nine years, the only boy who died in those you know, period died of cystic fibrosis. That's a genetic condition. So that something is genetic. 
does not mean it's good, bad or neutral. It just tells you it's deep. But I think, Hayden, since you're here, why don't you answer all the hard questions? <laughs> um, yeah, um, there's this question, yeah, so like where does it come from? Is it because of sin? And it's related to another one um, that, that someone asked is, uh, Hayden, if you were not born gay by birth and did not choose to be gay, where did your desires come from? Um, well, there's typically a, a general pattern of, of um, uh, th there's a typical commonality among uh, men who, who have same-sex attraction where there is often, sometimes they actually don't know where it comes from. Uh, so it can be a bit, uh, a bit of a mystery, but generally, very, very generally, it's like eight to nine times out of ten, there are issues where there's been a breakdown in the relationship between a boy and his same-sex parent, his father, uh, usually where the father is absent and there, there might even be like a, a dominant mother figure. Um, there may have been through death or divorce or negligence, um, a father is absent and so he learns to sexualize his need for other men. Um, because uh, as he grew up, he did not have other male role models to take his place. It's a very, very common thing. Now, that doesn't mean that every man who has an absent or a negligent father will necessarily become gay. In the Bible, there are countless examples of, of shocking father role models like Jacob and Abraham and Isaac. There's a whole stack of them. Even Jesus' own earthly parents were pretty slack. They left him in the temple for four days in the height in the height of Passover. And then when they find him in the temple, they point the finger at the kid and go, what have you done to us? So, you know, the Bible actually is a handbook on negligent fathers. Um, so it's a, common, it's a common theme. And interestingly, the very last prophecy of the Old Testament, Malachi, is to reunite children to their fathers lest God strike the lamb of the curse. So in Jesus, there's this, there's this big expectation that he's going to reunite children the, of, of humanity with their, earthly, with their heavenly father um, and even with their earthly fathers. So um, it, is, it is a big source of, um, of, of sexual brokenness. Um, one chapter in the, in the Old Testament that, can, that, that really kind of exemplifies this is, um, is uh, Judges 17, if ever you get the, the time to read it. Um, so that's one thing. In lesbianism, um, there, there, there can be issues where um, a girl, for example, might have been told by her father that he didn't want a daughter, he wanted a son. And so the girl then um, um, right, reads her femininity as being weak. Um, she might have been sexually abused by a man. Um, there might even be issues between the mother and her and, and, and her daughter that that can that can um, instigate this, but sexuality is is, is quite tricky, um, and it's not to be reductionistic and say that everyone who's gone through X experience ends up like this, um, but that's generally the pattern. Um, what does Liberty Ministries do? Um, well, that's a great question because it leads into my last point that um, I've got out the front some brochures about what we do, um, and uh, so you can take that and and read it and do whatever you want. Um, but uh, I do a fair bit of um, stuff on the, on the internet, so um, like answering questions like are people born gay and that sort of stuff. I go to churches, I share my testimony, I preach, I also train up pastors and ministers, uh, a lot of whom don't know how to deal with pastoral issues, um, either because they've never been shown or for other reasons. Uh, so um, I've actually been putting together a pastoral journey for pastors so that they can help anyone um, in, these, in, in a situation like this or for any other problem. Uh, so if you would like, um, I also run support groups, I meet one-to-one -one with people um, and because we're Liberty Christian Ministries plural, we actually help people with any other sorts of problems as well if, if that's, if that's um, what you'd like us to do. So that's what we do.